भक्ति सरण सह पंचाशी याचा द्वितीय अहम बंते सरण सह पंचाशी याचा तीयपी अहम बंते सरण सह पंचाशी याचा नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मास 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 ृतीयपी ृतीयपी ृतीयपीतामी ृतीयपी ृतीयपी ृतीयपीलेनोगद पैराग्राफ न and here the clause neither for amusement is stated for the purpose of abandoning support for delusion 
nor for intoxication abandoning support for head nor for smartening nor for embellishment is set for the purpose of abandoning support for greed and neither for amusement nor for intoxication is set for the purpose of preventing the arising of fetters for oneself not for smartening not for embellishment is set for the purpose of preventing the rising arising of fetters for another and the abandoning of both unwise practice and devotion to in should be understood as stated by these four only as the meaning already stated paragraph 91 of this body of this material body consisting of the four great primaries for the endurance for the purpose of continued endurance and continuance for the purpose of not interrupting life's continued occurrence or for the purpose of endurance for a long time he makes use of the alms food for the purpose of endurance for the purpose of continuance of the body as the owner of an old house uses props for his house and as a carter uses axle grease not for the purpose of amusement intoxication sparking and embellishment furthermore endurance has so what has been said as far as the words for the endurance and continuance of this body can be understood to mean for the purpose of maintaining the occurrence of the life faculty in this body i do have a question oh, on paragraph 90 it says there nor for intoxication is said for the purpose of abandoning support for hate why is hate uh, connected with intoxication i mean the words aren't actually connected so You just have to take his word for it. But are we capable of hindering the life faculty with not eating or not eating properly or things like that? So I mean, I guess I understand that it can affect the body, but the life continue uh, the life faculty itself. Well, I'm told that if you don't eat you die, so I think that interrupts the life faculty, no? Yeah, so they are related to each other, not that, not separated, basically. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't read too much into this. It's you can see he's really going through it with a fine tooth comb. But this is uh, remember, this is about alms food. Why you should use it? You use it to live. That's all it says. He's just um, this is the commentary way of making things precisely clear. But he's not saying anything special. He's just saying that. If you don't have, if you don't eat, what the Buddha is saying is that it interrupts your life. It's a, it's a reflection. You reflect that, oh, if I don't eat, I will die, and if I die, I won't be able to continue my spiritual development, my development of the Buddha's teaching. So that would be a bad thing. Even arahants generally continue to eat, right? So for them, it's actually so just refusing food uh would it be a hatred mind right so an arahant, an arahant goes on alms round the idea of, or they accept food that is given to them they do the alms round because the buddha said to do the alms round and they accept food because it is given and when people give you food you eat it but they don't eat a lot I think they eat very little but it keeps them alive I was just commenting on the way he's going into detail. It's like for those who, uh, for those where it wasn't clear, he's he's like, okay, now I will make it clear for you and for you. And he's going into more and more detail, and just um, strengthening this uh, his point. So there are no further questions. That's exactly how the commentary read. He's just doing the commentary thing, but the commentaries are like. The commentaries are a lot of this word definition stuff, but you'll see interspersed are teachings that are interesting and even stories in certain spots. Like paragraph 90 is interesting because it actually says something that's not in the text at all. It's not just an explanation. It 
It's a categorization of these things. Second categorization is two of the reasons not to eat food are, have nothing to do with, well, according to here, this statement have nothing to do with your own benefit, but it's because, uh, I mean, this isn't really accurate, but it is um, an interesting statement that when you make your, when you fatten yourself up or strengthen yourself up, you don't want to do that because it will lead to other people being attracted to your body, right? But it also, it's very much an ego thing, right? We do it because we want to attract other people, so it's still very much preventing the arising of fetters for us. Some people do it because they want to stay healthy. Do what? To stay healthy, so the yeah, body is healthy. I don't know, exercise. Uh, well, this isn't talking about exercise. It's talking about food. So I guess it, it goes hand in hand. People will body build and uh, take protein powder and special kinds yeah. of food. But they do it because they want to look good. Absolutely. If uh, if you don't exercise, even skinny people get a pot belly. And nobody wants to look like that. But if you're a monk, you don't care. You can be very thin, but you still get a pot belly if you don't exercise. 92. For the ending of discomfort... Hunger is called discomfort in the sense of afflicting. He makes use of arms food for the purpose of ending that, like anointing a wound, like counteracting heat with coal, and so on. For assisting the life of purity, for the purpose of assisting the life of purity, consisting in the whole dispensation and the life of purity consisting in the path. For while this speaker is engaged in crossing the desert, by means of devotion to, to, to the three trainings, depending on body strength, whose necessary condition is the use of arms food, he makes use of it to assist the life of purity, just as those seeking to cross the desert flesh, just as those craft, and just as those seeking to cross an ocean use a ship. This uh, story is very powerful. This uh, where the parents who cross the desert use their child's flesh. It's a uh, note twenty nine. If someone wants to read it, very Fante in one of his talk he mentioned this. I think the talk is food. So the title is food. Very good talk. I recommend it. Thus I shall put a stop to old feelings and shall not arouse new feelings. Thus a sick man uses medicine. He uses alms food, thinking, by use of this alms food, I shall put a stop to old feeling of hunger, and I shall not arouse a new feeling of immoderate eating. Like one of the proverbial Brahmins, that is one who eats till he has to be uh, helped up by hand, or till his clothes will not meet, or till he rolls there on the ground, or till he, cr or till crows can peck from his mouth, or till he vomits what he has eaten. Or alternatively, there is that which is called old feelings, because being conditioned by former comma, it arises now in dependence on unsuitable, immoderate eating. I shall put a stop to that old feeling for stalling its condition by suitable, moderate eating. And there is that which is called new feeling because it will arise in the future independence on the accumulation of comma consisting in making improper use of requisite of alms food. Now I shall also not arouse that new feeling, feeling avoiding by means of proper use of the use the production of its root. This is how the meaning should be understood here. What has been shown so far can be requisites, abandoning of devotion to self-mortification, and not giving up lawful bliss, pleasure. And I shall be healthy. In this body, which exists in dependence on requisites, I shall, by moderate eating, have health called long endurance, since there will be no danger of severing the life faculty or interrupting the continuity of the postures. Reflecting in this way, he makes use of the alms food for chronic disease does of his medicine, and blameless and live in comfort, literally, and have blamelessness and a comfortable abiding, 
He makes use of them thinking, I shall have blamelessness by avoiding improper search, acceptance, and eating, and I shall have a comfortable abiding by moderate eating. Or he does so thinking, I shall have blameness, blamelessness due to absence of such faults as boredom, sloth, sleepiness, blamed by the wise, etc., that have unseemly immoderate eating as their condition. And I shall have a comfortable abiding by producing bodily strength that has seemly moderate eating as its condition. Or he does so thinking, I shall have blamelessness by abandoning the pleasure of lying down, lolling in torpor, through refraining from eating as much as possible to stuff the belly. And I shall have a comfortable abiding by controlling the four postures through eating four or five mouthfuls less than the maximum. For this is said, With four or five lumps still to eat, let him then end by drinking water. For energetic vicar's needs, this should suffice to live in comfort. Now what has been shown at this point can be understood as discernment of purpose and practice of the middle way. Nita has a question. For the ending of this comfort, is this not a sense pleasure? Well, the ending of discomfort doesn't mean the experience of pleasure. Bhante, what are some examples of lawful pleasure? Is it like joy in meditation or something? Lawful bliss is in the in paragraph 93. Lawful. Sorry, I was looking something up in the commentaries. I wasn't paying attention to what you got. Lawful bliss, not abandoning of devotion to self. That sounds like the jhanas. Yeah, it does mention the jhanas somewhere. Not abandoning dhammikas. Dhammika means it's not lawful, but uh, in line with dhamma. And indeed, it says jhana sukha. Adinang Pachaya Buddhasa Kaya Sukasa Avi Sajanatu. Yeah. So it's not Kaya it's not Kaya Sukha. Jana Sukha. Did this just mean the pleasure of being in line with the Dhamma and knowing that you're in line with the Dhamma? No. I mean I guess technically it could include any uh I don't it has to be jhana sukha, say Yeah, I mean, if you suppose you do good deeds, and you recollect the good deeds that you've done and feel happy about that, that's not necessarily. That could be dhammika sukha. So it could also be liking. You could like the feeling. But I think commentaries wouldn't be interested in that kind of of meaning. It's talking more about jhana sukha and nibbana sukha. I thought this is related to the food still. Yeah, why why he brings it up here, it's funny that it doesn't talk about does it not talk about Kama Sukalika Yoga? It says Atagilama Tantana Yoga Pahana. What doesn't it say? It's talking about uh, Vedana, right? This paragraph is talking about the aspect of eating food that gets rid of uh, painful feelings. And so getting rid of painful feelings is twofold, or has two benefits. The first benefit is that it helps you. It um, qualifies as avoiding torch, self-torture, Adikilamatano Yoga, which the Bodhisattva tried, right? That's what you were probably going to say, Sanka. And the other thing it does is that Without that sort of pain, it allows you to practice the jhanas because without, without a, a peaceful body, the jhanas are not easy to cultivate. I mean, no meditation is really easy if you're hungry, weak from hunger. Yeah, the Bodhisattva lost the jhanas once he started cultivating or started practicing Atta Kinamata right. Yoga. Right, exactly, yes. I guess even the immaterial jhanas that he acquired, right? Yeah. Uh, the word bliss is an unfortunate translation. I think we've talked about this in the Jimanikaya as well. Why they translate 
Well, he puts pleasure in brackets, but why they translate sukha as bliss, I can't really fathom. It's so um, misleading. Because sukha is such a simple word that literally does mean, I mean, the only thing it could really be translated to or should be translated to is happiness because it's the simple word for the opposite of dukkha. So either pleasure or happiness. Happiness is the best. We talked about this because if you say pleasure, well, nibbana is also sukha, but nibbana isn't exactly pleasure. So happiness is a word, I remember talking about this exact thing, happiness is a word that can be used in a philosophical sense. Nibbana is, is happiness, not, not exactly philosophical, but in a yeah, kind of, in a technical sense. And Nibbana is the greatest happiness. 95. Resting place, Senazana. This is the bed, Sena, and seat, Asana. Or wherever one sleeps, city, whether in a monastery or in a lean to, etc. That is the bed, Sena. Wherever one seats oneself, Asati, sits, Nisi Dati, that is the seat, Asana. Both together are called resting place or abode, Senasana, for the purpose of warding off the perils of climate and enjoying retreat. The climate itself, in the sense of imperiling Parisahana, is perils of climate, Utu Parisaya unsuitable climatic conditions that cause mental distraction due to bodily affliction can be warded off by making use of the resting place. It is for the purpose of warding off these and for the purpose of the pleasure of solitude, is what is meant. Of course, the warding off of climate is stated by the phrase protection from cold, etc. Two. But just as in the case of making use of the ropes, the concealment of the private parts is stated as an invariable purpose while the others are periodical purposes. So here, also this last should be understood as mentioned with reference to the invariable warding off of the perils of climate. Or alternatively, this climate of the kind stated is just climate. But perils are of two kinds, evident perils and concealed perils. Herein, evident perils are lions, tigers, etc. By concealed perils are greed, hate, and so on. When a bhikkhu knows and reflects, thus in making use of the kind of resting place where these perils do not, owing to unguarded doors, and sight of unsuitable visible objects, etc., cause affliction, he can be understood as one who, reflecting wisely, makes use of the resting place for the purpose of warding off the perils of climate. The requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. Here, cure, pachaya, equals going against, is in the sense of going against Pati Ayana, illness, in the sense of countering, is the meaning. This is a term for any suitable remedy. It is the medical man's work, Visakasa Kamang, because it is permitted by him. Thus, it is medicine, Pesacha, or the cure for the sick itself as medicine is. Medicine as cure for the sick. Any work of a medical man, such as oil, honey, ghee, etc., that is suitable for one who is sick, is what is meant. A requisite, parikara, however, is, it is well supplied with the requisites of a city, is equipped in its equipment. In such passages as the chariot 
has the requisite of virtue, the axle of jhana, the wheel of energy. It is an ornament. In such passages as the requisites for the life of one who has gone into homelessness that should be available. It is an access accessory. But here, both equipment and accessory are applicable. For that medicine as a cure for the sick is equipment for maintaining life, because it protects by preventing the arising of affliction destructive to life. And it is an accessory too, because it is an instrument for prolonging life. That is why it is called requisite. So it is medicine as cure for the sick, and that is a requisite. Thus it is a requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. He makes use of that requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. Any requisite for life consisting of oil, honey, molasses, ghee, etc. that is allowed by med by a medical man as suitable for the sick is what is meant. 97. From Arisen, from born become produced. Hurtful here, hurt, hurt affliction is a disturbance of elements, it is leprosy, tumors, boils, etc., originated by that disturbance. Hurtful? Veya badika, because a reason in the form of hurt, via bada, feelings, painful feelings, feelings unprofitable karma from those hurtful feelings. For complete immunity from affliction, for complete freedom from pain, so that all that is painful is abandoned, is the meaning. This is how this virtue concerning requisites should be understood. In brief, its characteristic is the use of requisites after wise reflection. The word meaning here is this. Because breathing things go, ayanti, move, proceed using what they use in dependence on these robes, etc. These robes, etc are therefore called requisites, patraya. Concerning requisites is concerning those requisites. Um, 98. So in this fourfold virtue, patimoka restraint has to be undertaken by means of faith. For this is accomplished by faith, since the announcing of training precepts is outside the disciples' province. And the evidence here is the refusal of the request to allow disciples to announce training precepts. Having therefore undertaken through faith the training precepts without exception as announced, one should completely perfect For this is said, as a hen guards her eggs, or as a yak her tail, or like a darling child, or like an only eye, so who are engaged your virtue to protect, be prudent at all time, and never scrupulous. Also it is said further, so too, sire, when a training precept for disciples is announced by me, my disciples do not transgress it, even for the sake of life. So the Sinhalese version says that it was Venerable Sariputta who uh, requested to introduce many rules uh, which, to which the Buddha rejected was which Sariputta? Isn't this one of Devadatta's requests? You're thinking of something else, I think. Uh, it mentions that the Agamehi Tavang Sariputta Tathagato Tathang Kalang Jani Jani Sansati says that uh, it was requested by Venerable Sariputta. Maybe that's right. 
Why does he have in brackets your request to allow disciples to announce training precepts? I know Sariputta did request him to to tell them the rules, but that was the Buddha telling the rules. That wasn't one of his disciples. I, I do apologize if this has been partly explained. I, I could have missed it because my audio kept cutting out. Um, but are, are you talking about um, what it what it means when it says um, the the disciples can't um, uh, uh, announce the precepts? Is, is, does that mean like they can't um, t- teach them to to no, other people, can, or, or they can introduce new precepts? Only the Buddha can introduce new precepts. Oh, okay. Thank you. Lisa has a question. I think it is re- uh, related to maybe what we read uh, today. So what are the benefits of practicing moderation in eating according to Buddhist principles? Kind of what was explained here, that food is such a foundational part of our existence that it's one of the main things, main sources of craving and diversion. So moderation helps us to face that craving and aversion. Moderation doesn't mean what people would think it means. Moderation means eating just enough to survive. And one meal a day would be real moderation in eating. It's not quite moderation even. It means knowing knowing the amount. Vojanimatanyutta, knowing the amount of in regards to food, knowing how much you need and eating according to that. 99. And the story of the elders bound by robbers in the forest should be understood in this sense. It seems that robbers in the Mahavatani forest bound an elder down. While he lay there for seven days, he augmented his insight, and after reaching the fusion of non-return, he died there and was born in the Brahma world. Also, found another elder in Tambapani Island, Sri Lanka, with string creepers and made him lie down. When a forest fire came and creepers were not caught, he escaped inside and attained Nibbana simultaneously with his death. When the elder Abhaya, a preacher of the Dika Nikaya, passed by with 500 bhikkhus, he saw what had happened and he had the elder's body cremated and a shrine built. Therefore, let other clansmen also maintain the rules of conduct pure, renouncing life if there be need, rather than break virtue's restraint, but the was savior decreed. I think I mentioned these stories earlier. The idea is, I didn't quite understand either, but the idea is I think that the creepers are still alive. And so cutting them would be breaking a very, very minor rule not to destroy plant life. Very hard to imagine that the creeper can be that strong to i mean you can bind with with the creeper what about the creeper being strong like you can break out you can but that would break the precept oh. hundred and us patimoka restraint is undertaken out of faith so restraint of the sense faculties should be undertaken with mindfulness for that is accomplished by mindfulness, because when the sense faculties functions are founded on mindfulness, there is no liability to invasion by covetousness and the rest. So, recollecting the fire discourse, which begins thus, better because the extirpation of the eye faculty by a red-hot burning, blazing, glowing iron spike than the apprehension of signs in the particulars of visible objects cognizable by the eye. 
This restraint should be properly undertaken by preventing with unremitting mindfulness any apprehension in the objective field consisting of visible data, etc., of any signs, etc., likely to encourage covetousness, etc., to invade consciousness occurring in connection with the idor, and so on. When not undertaken thus, virtue of Patimokkha restraint is unenduring. It does not last like a crop not fenced in with branches, and it is raided by the robber, de robber defilements as a village with open gates is by thieves, and lust leaks into his mind as rain does into a badly roofed house. For this is said, among the visible objects and thieves and tangibles, called the faculties. For when these doors are open and unguarded, then thieves will come and train us. It were a village. And just as with an ill-roofed house, the rain comes leaking in, so too. Will lust come leaking in for sure upon an undeveloped mind? Tamapada 13. If you become a bhikkhu and take this precept, this has to be taken so seriously that you don't transgress it, even if you're dying. Sounds very no, serious. It doesn't to me. Have to. An enlightened being wouldn't be concerned with their life, so they wouldn't break the precepts even to save their life. It's it's um, interesting that he reminds us that the precepts are taken out of faith and pointing out why that is. We don't normally think of precepts in that way, but you have to take them on faith, right? Because if you knew that something was wrong, well, you wouldn't have to keep the precepts in the first place. And um, it's especially interesting as relates to the monastic precepts, because many of the monastic precepts don't relate to wholesomeness or unwholesomeness at all. Their function, uh, the the Buddha's idea or ideal of what the monk's life should be like. I mean, even things like using money, it's not unethical to use money, but it goes against the idea, very fundamentally, the idea of the monastic life. So what I mean by the, the that is, or what I mean by the faith thing is that we don't keep those rules because it's un our faith in the Buddha makes us think, uh, makes us want to maintain the Buddha's ideal of what the monastic life should be. So these, a lot of this is specific to, a lot of the ideas even are specific to mon uh, monastic precepts. Like obviously any Buddhist should not kill to save their life or steal to save their life. Or, lie to save their life but this is even sort of more extreme and hard to fathom because it's not unethical to cut the creepers really just these monks are thinking oh, if, I, if i if i break these rules it would be going against the buddhist precepts and that's the buddha we're talking about and so just out of faith in the buddha they don't break these otherwise meaningless rules right well, yeah. not entirely, because the Buddha did enforce them for a reason, but in this case, it's pretty meaningless for him not to cut the creeper or break the creeper. It's only meaningful when you think of, well, this is a monastic rule. This is a Buddha's rule, not just any rule that some disciples set. Bhante, you used the word faith, but maybe respect or out of reverence for the Buddha is more fitting. For me, at least. Um, well, no. The point he makes about faith is that because the disciples don't know that the rules are important, they don't know what rules are important. So you have to. You don't know that the Buddha said this rule is important. That's rule is important. So you don't undertake them because oh yeah, I know that that's wrong. You undertake them because you don't know that it's wrong. 
you undertake them as rules. So I don't know that this is wrong, so I'll just take it as a rule instead. Because if you knew it was wrong, you wouldn't need faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. If you knew it was wrong, sorry. If you wouldn't knew it was wrong, you wouldn't need a rule. Yes. I, I guess that that's the part I don't I don't really understand that. Um, like you said, the some of these rules are not even concerned with uh, unwholesome minds. Like you, you don't even have unwholesome minds with it. So is this just a like a way of living or giving examples or like how monks should be or something like I don't I don't see why or even important to keep. Well, there's different reasons. For this one, I think mainly it relates to not farming. Monks can't farm or have, have bonsai trees or something. It's a, a lot of it's for distraction from the practice and the goal. So these sorts of activities would distract the monks. Hmm. By not allowing them to even cut plant life, uh, they're, they're prohibited from a lot of activity that would otherwise... Well, that you've seen monks nowadays engaging in. You'll see monks cutting grass. I know monks who prune rose bushes and plant roses and are obsessed with rose bushes, which is... I mean, how do you uh, defend that? Just... Maybe they are not practicing, and that's the reason, right? No, they're not. There's, there's no justification, but yeah, what I mean is that it happens when you see it. You also see monks uh, growing vegetable gardens and having their own vegetables. So, I mean, none of this is unethical, but it, it surely goes against the Buddha's intention for the monastic life. And it, it makes you ask the question, what is the difference between these monks and ordinary lay people? There's not really much, dif there's not so much difference. They turn into priests, or they're just doing it for livelihood. Of, yeah, they're ordained for livelihood rather than for something higher. Someone had a question? I wanted to ask that in this context is not similar with the even if one's head gets on fire, um, one should uh, practice. Uh, one should one practice should... as though one's head is on fire. Meaning if your head is on fire, turban is on fire, you should put it out very quickly. So in the same way you should dispel wrong view through practice very quickly. Okay, thank you. More about the, uh, uh, having a sense of urgency, being diligent. What about in the case of um, when your family is against you practicing or you having a right view, or I guess they're just not helpful? Well, other than with things like like money and views about money, of course, should one just stay in those situations, or should one just cut ties? Maybe decide that that's for the best. There's not so much cutting ties in Buddhism. Not really. How? The only reason you cut ties is out of aversion. Okay, couldn't you just say that that person is no longer a part of my life? It's pretty egotistical. Thank you, Bhante. The Buddha's teaching is about how to face things, not how to avoid things. No, of course. I, I think it's just because I'm only... It's all, it's all pretty new, so... Well, the problem for me isn't the avoiding part. You, you should avoid lots of things. You should avoid certain people. You should even avoid things that are too challenging. So you avoid them temporarily, but that's avoiding. That's not cutting off. There's a categorical difference between those two. There's, there are many things you should avoid categorically just by their very nature. But those things are not generally people, based on people's behavior. Those are um, like prostitutes, for example. Those are the kind of people you might avoid. Uh, but even a prostitute, that's, I think, more for a monk. Prostitutes, bhikkhunis, monks should not, bhikkhus should not hang out with bhikkhunis and vice versa. Uh, widows, monks should not hang out with widows. 
Well, there are certain people that by the very virtue of their activity in certain places and that sort of thing that you might think should be avoided out of out of their nature. People and their attitudes, um, you, you avoid them, but you avoid them really just on a case-by-case -case basis. I think shutting people out of your life is not really a Buddhist thing to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes, of course, if people are, if they're dangerous, or if they, yeah, or like if they have guns or, I don't know, like stuff like that, I guess, that would constitute grounds to avoid them as well, right? How do you but, cut off people? I mean, one, one of the dukkhas you face in life is called Appiya Sampayoga Dukkha. So it's, as long as you're in Sansara, you're going to meet <laughs> unpleasant people. It's not cutting off. Uh, I mean, you can keep running from them, but they are going to keep uh, coming as long as you're in Sansara. I think one important point that should be made is you avoid, but you you shouldn't. It means you shouldn't reach out to those people. You shouldn't make plans to meet with those people. That's what is meant by avoiding those people, not uh, running away from a situation, for example. So if you have bad friends, for example, or no, you you are about to make plans to meet with bad friends, then that would be maybe a bad idea because you are deciding to meet with them, and that should be maybe avoided. I was thinking more about, like, maybe, like, cutting off ties with, like, your parents, or, I don't know. Like, no, I mean, it was just, it, it's, I had some underlying issues with money. I mean, I just came into, like, a new situation, so, um, yeah, it was just, uh, I don't know, something that I really think is is important or i would say that has affected my life for a long time so yeah it's just i mean i don't want to bother um with it but yeah just wanted to get an opinion so if someone makes you angry for example it can be good to avoid them temporarily if you think you're not able to be mindful around them but like temporarily until you're good at it that's 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 the sort of practical avoidance. It's not always the case that you have to face everything. Yes, you're right. Of course, you face things, but uh, avoiding can be strategic. I mean, we teach this to meditators all the time. Pain is the most common one. When they experience a lot of pain, just move your legs mindfully. But understand that that's not the long-term solution. Eventually, you're going to have to face it. So you just uh, another thing we tell people to do is to alleviate the pain. So don't don't remove the pain, but you can prop prop your legs up, sit a little higher on your bottom, that sort of thing. And what that does is it makes the pain uh, tolerable. So there's still pain, but it's not pain that lasts. It's also not pain that lasts after you uh, stop meditating and then becomes a long term problem, right? So it's much more suitable to to face. So you can you can apply that to people as well, I suppose, in some in small doses. For people that cause problems for you, you should limit your interaction with them to amounts that you can be mindful with, sort of thing. All right. Thank you, Bante. Appreciate all the advice. Bante, what happens? to the relationships that you, I mean, you had, that you become a monk. So do you like cut ties or you, you keep those? Or I mean, what happens if, yeah, they, they want to stay in your life or things like that? I, and, and I'm not referring to family or anything, just friendships or even um, romantic relationships, for example. Like what happens after you become a monk? No, there's no. And the only one, the only one that I could really categorically comment on is, of course, the romantic relationships. Those, unsurprisingly, become a monk. For the rest of them, 
it's uh, sort of on a case by case basis and i would say what what much more affects your relationships is your practice and i mean becoming a monk of course yes it affect them a lot but um, I think on a deeper level, practice does. And, and becoming a monk is sort of an extension of practice. Someone becomes a monk because they're dedicated to their practice, and that affects relationships because of people's expectations and their unfulfilled expectations. It creates a lot of stress for people who are attached to the person. My parents freaked out. Well, my father, anyway, was quite, had a hard time I, mean, I had a hard time as well, but it was a hard time all around before well before I became a monk i'm just I'm just thinking you you became a monk uh, very early in the early ages so but right. someone who is like lived as a lay person for for much longer, let's say even has children or something like I mean you cannot cut ties yeah, but i I mean. No, but that's that's my point, is that this idea of cutting ties doesn't sound very Buddhist. Exactly. Yeah, I also wanted to mention that it sounds very radical. Like, you have to go out of your way to cut ties. You can just keep silent and tell people about your plans, and maybe they accept it, maybe they don't. But you don't actually have to tell them that you just don't want to do anything, have to do anything with them. I mean, there's stuff that looks like cutting ties, like uh, there's this one monk who uh, his wife came and brought her, their baby, laid it down in front of him, and he just stayed silent, didn't even acknowledge her. But if she came to him in a different way and was asking for advice or that sort of thing, maybe he would have responded differently. I mean, I know a monk that he ordained when he was like 37, years old so he had already lived a lot of lay life and he worked as like yeah he worked and you know lived his life and then finally decided to ordain and yeah, it's just so interesting how everybody but you know so he's from argentina so he kind of cut ties with argentina and then moved to california lived his life there and then cut ties again with uh, california and moved to mexico and yeah it's it's interesting. He's been there ever since, in almost like twenty five years. But the reason one person uh, a person gets ordained is uh, usually because he's uh, so uh, they come sunk up uh, has developed up to that level. So unless you are ordaining for the wrong reasons, so if you are if your mind is developed up to that level, then usually you don't have any. Uh, you have much less uh, attachment towards uh, your previous uh, uh, relationships or uh, people you are you were in a relationship with. So it happens naturally. You have to be a little bit careful of your use of usually and mostly. Not not always the case with monks. There were cases even in the Buddhist times of of families ordaining together and then spending all their time chatting. And we and the Buddha had to chastise them. Maybe maybe they ordained for the wrong reasons, but yeah, yeah. But just to be clear, it's not mostly. No, you make a good point. Some of it is what you gain. Like many people will ordain without ever having practiced meditation, and then only get an opportunity to practice. So in the beginning, they might not have that. No, I mean you make a good point. Even someone who hasn't practiced is still, you could say they have nikama. They're not really interested in paying attention. But a lot of people do ordain, or you know, many people ordain, try and run away from things, and will find themselves going back to relatives later on as they develop spiritually as monks. The monk across from me has two children. And his children and his wife come all the time to visit him, not in a bad way. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not criticizing, but they're very much involved in the monastery. When we had this big uh, event yesterday, his son was taking pictures and lighting candles, and I think he took a couple of pictures. Or he took a bunch of pictures of me, actually. He took a video of me, actually. Posted that video. That's his son took that, I think. 
son's 28 years old. I, I was going to ask about um, not not associating with with certain people and so forth. Um, is is there sometimes exceptions to that? Because um, I, I know like uh, Maha Kasapa, they they talked about him. He would associate with a lot of the people who were looked down on in, in society and such. And uh, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the, the monk whose wife came to visit because it wasn't that another thing that some of the other monks would uh, question Maha Kasapa about is he, he um, his former wife who who also ordained he would sometimes visit her. So isn't there sometimes scenarios where a, a monk might associate with people like that, or was it only certain kinds of people who were looked down on and that he'd associate with and others he'd still avoid? I don't remember Kasapa specifically being spending time with outcasts. I, don't, I also don't remember him spending much time with his wife, but I could be just missing that. Uh, um, it, it wasn't necessarily Necessarily that he spent a lot of time with her, but sometimes he'd bring her um, le leftover alms food and things like that. Uh, yes, yes. Um, it, it's, uh, at least in the, uh, I think that that's from the Maha Parinibbana Sutta commentary. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up and, and, and share it. And then I also know um, uh, Mingun Sayadaw in the uh, end of the Maha Buddha Vamsa when he's giving the biographies of the different great disciples. He mentions it there as well. well Maha Kasapa was uh, very strict in his sila, so I'm sure he didn't do anything wrong. But uh, association with between bhikkhus and bhikkhunis has to be regulated for obvious reasons. Yeah. And I, I think, um, too, if I remember correctly, kind of part of um, what was explained with Maha Kasapa is, is because he was uh, you know, very strict with his sila you know he, he wasn't you know things that uh you know other people might you know criticize other monks for he, you know when he'd give alms food to his wife it wasn't out of attachment and, and things like that I, I know that was one of the, the things that was explained so yeah i want the confirmation that he actually gave alms food to his wife i'm just a little confused about the you mentioned the monk uh, living there on Trumpoy. How is that not breaking the rules, basically? Uh, what, what, what do you think is breaking the rules? There was like a description of how monks behave um, improperly if they endear a child. I, mm -hmm. I remember oh, right. stroking their head or something. Well, yeah. You'll find that those rules are not so strictly considered. A lot of monks here don't read a lot, and don't learn a lot, and, and even then aren't really interested a lot in, in these details. They listen to talks by teachers, but it's a lot more about meditation. It does make things awkward sometimes when there's people have different ideas about right behavior. Uh, Bhante, I have a question um, on 100. Um, it says or that it is com accomplished by mindfulness because when the sense faculties functions are founded on mindfulness. So here it seems like uh, before without mindfulness, we just uh, may be driven by the sense faculty functions. But right now we should use mindfulness as the foundation so that we can uh, the sensations or the faculties i am uh, am i understanding this correctly or as another way to explain this part thank you yeah i'm not quite sure what you're asking but what you mean by guarding but it sounds right but you're not interrupting or or you're not stopping the sense faculties. You're stopping the reactions to the sense faculties. Got it. Okay. So it's not the sense. The guarding is guarding the sense faculties, but not guarding against the sense faculties, right? You're not trying to stop seeing or hearing. You're guarding them so that bad things don't uh, result from them. So they're they're called doors. And they're likened to gates or doors, and 
and you'll have a guard at the door. And so you guard and you watch the people that come in and out through the doors, just as just as you guard people, guard, guard watching people. You with mindfulness, you guard the the senses, watching the things that impinge at the senses, so sights and sounds and smells, and you guard them. You don't stop them from coming in, but with the guard there, they behave, so they don't commit crimes. And likewise, when you see things, then it doesn't lead to liking or disliking or identification, me, mine, that sort of thing. To use mindfulness as a guard, or if we practice mindfulness, we probably will change inside and outside how we interact with people with mindfulness as a guard. Yes. Okay, thank you. It purifies the experience. So paragraph 100 is the, the important one here relating to the practice of meditation. A lot of this is pretty dry, I guess. And if you're not a monk, it's maybe not even all that interesting talking about the, the details of the monastic life. Paragraph 100 is, uh, reminds us about sila that relates to actual practice. Now, I don't see anything about Kasaba giving food to his wife. I'm not saying it couldn't have happened, but I'm wondering if it was someone else you're thinking of. It possibly was. I'm, I'm looking through that section right now trying to, to find that, that story. Um, I, 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 could, I could have sworn it was, but it, it's possible I'm misremembering. But if I find it, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. As far as I remember, they parted with even before uh, getting old. Day. I think they even found the Buddha's teaching uh, individually. Yeah, they were very keen to... Kasaba was very keen to separate. I mean, they both were because it didn't look great for them to be traveling around together. So it's kind of an example of the point that bhikkhus and bhikkhunis have to have some measure of separation. They don't have to. It's such a valuable thing for them to do it. Well, isn't there nunneries too, like in India and stuff? So then... They can just have like their own uh, monasteries. Well, they just they they have to uh, receive teachings from the bhikkhus. And they had to at that time. They were lacking in a lot of knowledge because they were new. So it had it was like okay, you've got these new monastics. Well, if they were male, you just have them go to learn with the male monks, right? But here they're female. Well, okay, what do we do? So there's a special official teaching that would go on and a monk had to be selected based on his likelihood his likely uh likely to be disturbed by women that reminds me of how back in the day the vinya pitaka was established well after right because it was it was when people that had no real interest in the practice came into Buddhism because they wouldn't progress and stuff, so then the Vinayapitaka had to be established. Well, the monks' rules were established based on uh, based on people doing things wrong. Monks doing things wrong. Thank you, Bhante. Early on, it was mostly uh, Arahants and enlightened beings who were monks. I think up to 20 years, there were no idea. After that, monks started uh, Misbehaving. Yeah, there's quite a story about the first monk's rule. So is the Arya Sangha subject to the Vinaya Pitaka as well? Vinaya Pitaka is a large group of texts. You, don't, you aren't subject to it, you study it. So you, so you may be asking whether enlightened beings have to follow the rules? Monks have to follow the rules. It doesn't have anything to do with being enlightened. Rajesh has a question in the chat. Since the book path to purification is quite, quite involved. How do we apply these teachings and practice in daily life? Well, the teachings you should apply in daily life are pretty simple. This is quite detailed. But if you're coming here to look for teachings, I mean, you'll still get something out of it, talking all about uh, wholesome and unwholesome qualities and so on. But this is above and beyond what you need to practice in daily life. So there's a lot more here than just trying to apply all this in daily life. This is uh, scholarly study. So it's for many purposes. Some of it is for answering questions people have. Uh, some is it in the Buddha and his teachings. 
some of it is just um, studying for the sake of the goodness of, of the Buddha's teaching. If you feel good being here, if you feel good studying the Buddha's teaching, talking about the Buddha's teaching, just that, that feeling of appreciation is enough. Lumpur Chodok used to say, if you, if you listen to a Dhamma talk and you're happy to be listening to the Buddha's teaching, even if you don't understand a word of it, that's good merit, good, that's goodness. That's what I thought might have been meant by Dhammaka Sukha. No. I mean, it might be a part of it, but it's not really what they were likely referring to. They're referring to the kind of Sukha that is uh, disturbed by, by hunger. And that's relating to practice of meditation. I mean, as a as a lay person, I did notice that after studying the the sila part and going over and even though you kept saying this is for monks, this is for monks, I I still felt like overwhelmed and guilty or something after afterwards because of I mean now I know how a monk should behave and and it's just it's just not I guess feasible. As a late person, well, I mean, a lot of the con a lot of the the uh, principles here are are fully applicable to lay people, just not the the detail or the examples that they give, right? I mean, manipulating manipulation, um, bribery, uh, well, so many things that monks shouldn't do for livelihood. Lay people also shouldn't do for livelihood. You shouldn't be manipulative. Uh, you shouldn't be scheming, conniving, greedy. It's all valuable, but Buddhism isn't uh, a condemning practice. If you are greedy and you are manipulative, just as this is great to read about, so you can say, oh, I have to change in this way and this way. Even just knowing about it is valuable because you'll be more hesitant to be manipulative in the future, for example. Yeah, even learning about like the four requisites, it's valuable for lay practice to think of, well, what are my requisites and do I really need these things or is this something that I can be live without? It's very helpful, but I mean, I think it's not to the extreme or the extent that uh, bhikkhus is required to restrain themselves and stuff like that. But I also find it um, very helpful to just appreciate the monk's life, how powerful it, it can be. Because you, as a lay person, you don't really know about how much uh, difficulty a monk has to go through if they practice well. And uh, reading this, in a way, is also a good practical, I think. Absolutely. And more generally, just everything, reading all of anything about the Buddhist teaching doesn't mean you have to practice it. There's, there's a lot of this text that we're not going to get involved in practicing, but it's still great to learn about and great to appreciate. And it all reminds us of the Buddha and his, his dispensation. So just studying here, even if you don't put it into use, is uh, goodness. We've also just gotten through the 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 more commentarial passage. So today's passages were very dry, relatively speaking. Uh, coming up is a lot of stories. We've gotten through all the explanations of words and that sort of thing. Got a bunch of stories coming up, it looks like. And there's a lot more explanations as well. Are there passages on the repercussions or repercussions? In general, we'll have to see. So I think we have one last question from Hanin in the chat. Does believing in astrology or being superstitious weaken one's commitment to taking refuge in the spiritual gem? I don't really see how they're related. Someone can be very committed to taking refuge. Um, I mean, it, it, just not that in particular. What you're, what you refer to it can certainly weaken one's practice towards enlightenment but you know not necessarily 
doesn't have to be a significant impediment. Someone who became enlightened would probably give, well, would certainly give up superstition, but they'd probably give up astrology for the most part. They might not give it up completely. Wasn't yeah, astrology I mean, a science back uh, in the Buddha's day as well? Like, and and a good one as well. Like the, it could predict his future. Mm -hmm. So the astrologers, I I don't see why that is like astrology in particular because I've I've heard in the stories like why is that blame um, blameful or blamed in any way in Buddhist circles? Well, it's I guess thinking that's... about the future, let go of the future. It also can be quite manipulative, where people mm. um, are va purposefully vague, and so that people think it comes true when they could have been talking about anything. There's fake astrology, or it's used even when it's used uh, sincerely. It can be delusional. Does the person studying it wants it to be true? So they make connections where there are none, that sort of thing. Astrology is a large uh, area. Like it depends on uh, what uh, you mean by uh, as when you when you say you are following astrology. Like if you are believing in auspicious times, like uh, there there is a teaching. Uh, I think in one of the Jatakas, the Bodhisattva has said. Uh, what can the stars do? Like, uh, like uh, nakatang patima patima nitang ato balang pachaga ato atas nakatang kinkiri santitarakati. Yeah, there's like people will have their horoscopes and say, I'm this type of person and that I'm that type of person and that's because I was born at this time and this year. That you know, that's really valuable. I mean, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be harmful. An ego thing and a person, the idea of creating a personality or a sense of who you are and that sort of thing, sense of self. All right, that's all for me as well. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Thank you so much, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you all. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thanks, everybody.